One of the most frustrating things that can come up for the aspiring artist is the sheer unending number of things that we have to learn to draw. It seems like there is often, again, an endless array of different subject matters and objects and things that we need to learn to draw. And sometimes you can learn to draw one thing pretty well and then something else comes along and that seems like it's sort of almost a new challenge. Now, one of the best tools you can have to tackle this challenge is structural drawing or understanding structural anatomy and how to break forms down, how to have a basic system that allows you to kind of pretty much break anything down and learn how to draw it. But the question is like, what does that look like? How do you actually do that? Well, in this video, that's what I want to talk about. And I'm going to use the Fox character from my Pinocchio book to basically just describe how we can break down a subject matter and use a lot of the tools that we might already have from drawing, you know, humanoid anatomy or realistic anatomy and apply it to an anthropomorphic character that has strange proportions. How do we draw that and tackle that subject? Because again, often with projects, there is a wide variety of characters and things you need to draw. What I want to do is explain how that actually works and give you a few tips and techniques you can use so that you can do the same thing in your projects. Let's get started. All right, my name's Tim McBurney and I've been a professional artist for 20 years and a professional drawing teacher for 10 years. And I'm here to help you draw cool stuff from your imagination, to embrace the challenge of drawing and to master the craft of line and color illustration. Now, I've had to draw a wide variety of things in some cases because that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. Um, I, I like sort of doing different things. Sometimes I like drawing cartoony things. Sometimes I like drawing, you know, realistic-ish kind of spaceships and designing stuff for science fiction video games. Sometimes I like drawing sort of fantasy books. And again, you know, I had to draw pirates and pirate ships and buried treasure and uh, deserted desert islands for, uh, you know, the Seven Pirates book. Again, I think that this is both one of the most challenging things to deal with as an artist, um, but it's also one of the most enjoyable things. And I think that one of the biggest challenges that comes up is, again, not just this idea of how do we draw different things, but how do we do it in a way that's kind of fun, right? Like, how do we, how do we have a, a tool set, right? A tool chest of things that we can go and grab if someone says, hey, you need to draw this. I think in my career, one of the things that has really sort of made me enjoy the process and enjoy my career and enjoy drawing the most, again, is having these tools. Now, a big part of what I'm going to talk about is structural drawing, structural anatomy, and again, how we apply that to different subject matter. If that's something you're interested in and you'd like to learn a little bit more about it, go check out my mini workshop on the five most common mistakes that aspiring artists tend to make when they're constructing heads and faces. That'll give you, again, some more ways that you can deal with these challenges and it'll explain a little bit of the process. Um, so go check that out if that's something you're interested in. In this video, I'm going to talk more about the figure, the anatomy, and, and not just that, but how we handle stylized characters. So as I said, structural drawing is one of the main things that will help us take on new challenges. And structural drawing is where we think about form. We draw through and we learn drawing in a slightly technical way. We also often put in some of this structure and marks as we draw to help us troubleshoot our drawings when we're actually sort of working. And again, you can see this type of drawing being taught in a lot of places and you can see it in books such as Andrew Loomis's figure drawing for all it's worth. This is where again we think about the structure of what we're drawing and we develop and have systems that help us sequentially break down the figure 
and draw these really, really complicated things from different angles in different perspectives again, again, and again. You can see this type of structural drawing being used again in this book, but also in a lot of artists' work today. A lot of people working in the entertainment industry who are tasked with drawing a lot of technical things again and again really, really study this tradition of art. Now, as I said before, not everyone draws this way, and you can learn by just kind of practicing and getting better bit by bit. But this tradition of learning and practicing art is the one that I work in. And as I said, it's helped me a lot in my career to take on different projects and styles over the years. A big part of structural drawing is also the habit of drawing through, finding points that we don't see, measurements that we don't see, that aren't sort of at the front of the drawing. They might be at the back of the drawing, uh, they might be hidden, but we find them anyway and we use those to help us more accurately draw the things that we do see. It's really, really important for you to understand as an aspiring artist or someone who is wanting to get better at this structural drawing, that although we learn structural drawing in a relatively technical way and it can be a little bit boring, the application of it becomes more and more subconscious and intuitive as we develop to the point where as you progress, more and more of that structure happens in your mind, right? And that what we focus on in the end is the same thing everyone focuses on, the thing we're drawing, the story, the narrative, the emotion in the characters, the things that people actually care about. It's also important to understand that we don't need to learn all of perspective and form drawing and technical drawing to begin with. You can and you do add it bit by bit over the years, slowly improving the solidarity of your drawings, supporting the scenarios and projects that you want to complete right now. What I want to share in this video is simply how these techniques apply to drawing different things so you can learn and see them in action not as an abstract set of exercises where we're drawing boxes and perspective, right? Not as ideas, but as actually something that I can show you applied. Let's take a look at our Fox character here. Now I designed him really early on as part of the visual development of the book. There's a scene that's a real classic one with Pinocchio and the Fox and the cat. And we knew it was going to be part of the book. So that actually formed a big part of testing what the visual style of the overall project would be. So he got designed really early on and we kind of nailed what he looked like. Although in the process, we actually designed both the fox and the cat and some of the other animals as if they were real animals, just to see what that would look like, not these sort of anthropomorphic ones. But in the end, we decided to go with this kind of final look. The book, actually, the original book doesn't specify what everything sort of looks like. It just kind of has different sort of animal characters. And some of them feel as if they are sort of human. And a lot of them talk. But again, you know, some of them ended up being these kind of anthropomorphic characters like the fox and the cat. But then you have characters like the cricket, which kind of just seems to be like, you know, a normal cricket. And you have characters like the fox and the cat, which sort of act a lot and, and sort of do things that feel like they should be human. And then you might have some other characters like, again, there's a snake and there's a parrot that talks. So in the end, we just sort of made a call and said, well, some of these characters feel like from the text that they need to talk to humans and, you know, interact in a human way. And others felt like more like they're part of the natural environment. For the characters that are anthropomorphic, obviously that allows them to act and emote and have human gestures and feelings in a much more relatable way. There are many animal characters in Pinocchio and many of them are only in the book for a page or so. In those cases, it's often just a matter of winging it a bit and making sure the character looks the same from panel to panel. A good example of that would be the farmer and the farmer who kind of has the chickens and also the, the little sort of ferret weasel characters that are sort of part of this scene. Now, in this case, the character is only on the page for a very sort of short amount of time. And you can kind of just sort of wing that character a little bit based on a few sketches. We don't really have to create a consistent sort of, you know, high level sort of actor for that character, you can just kind of draw, draw them a few times. And again, sometimes that works, sometimes that sort of doesn't. 
but the at the end of the day that's kind of normally how that's done we don't need to kind of create elaborate designs for everything sometimes you can just sort of you know go on what's there and again even though they maybe don't match up 100 percent as much as they could if you get the iconic elements right again you know the guy's got a hat you know he's carrying this kind of gun over his shoulder um, if you get those right the audience is probably going to buy into it again because you can kind of see they're in the same scene. We don't have to sort of, you know, draw them in a different situation. However, when we have a character like the fox or the cat, they're going to carry across the book and they're going to be seen in different scenarios and different sort of situations. And in that case, it's just a natural process that we need to kind of dig a little bit deeper and design how that character functions and figure out what sort of posture they have, what sort of, you know, emotions they typically um, might sort of have. And, you know, just their sort of typical gestures that are going to give you that classic feeling of like, oh, that's that character because they're sort of standing that way. And the fox is one of those characters. He needed to be able to emote and act and make gestures. So I had to really think about how his body would work. If we just draw a simple character once, as I said, and we have to draw them from a similar angle, then it's quite easy to match that feeling of the drawing. Like this gorilla, for instance, is another good example. The character only appears here on these pages, and there's enough iconicness to the character in their situation that even if the character is not necessarily drawn perfectly so that they fit the model sheet 100 percent the the audience is probably going to understand what's happening and not really notice all of those little things again the the scene kind of carries that design to a certain degree to design a character like the fox though we still don't have that much time. It's not like, again, we have, you know, like weeks and weeks and weeks to sit there and sort of figure out exactly how this character works. I don't think that's often the case when you're working on sort of any project. We always need to be sort of efficient and we need to make sure that we give the audience a consistent character. But again, you know, we need to manage our time. If you see the process that animated feature films go through where, you know, designers are, you know, working on model sheets and figuring out all the little details, they're doing expression sheets. Often those characters get um, sculpted as three dimensional maquettes in clay and then they'll be prototyped in, you know, actual 3D if it's a if it's a 3D sort of uh, movie and then people will draw over that and adjust it and tweak it and modify it and there'll be a whole bunch of work that's done to make sure that's sort of consistent. In my experience in comics you need to be more efficient than that when you're actually working and also when you're just sort of drawing your own projects. All of those details can reside to a certain degree in your mind for the most part. Often artists will actually only have a small set of characters they tend to redraw from book to book and page to page you know for instance superman often looks like batman if you have a particular artist their superman and their batman is very very similar we don't need to redraw and redesign everything from scratch a good example that i often use for this is you can think of it as a good auteur director you can take someone like wes anderson they typically have the same set of actors in film to film and we don't really mind, right? We understand that this is sort of a, a fun thing. We understand what we're watching. And even though, you know, you might still see Bill Murray in every Wes Anderson film, we don't really care. We understand what's going on and we understand that these are actors and that's sort of what's happening. Now, Pinocchio in general offers a particular challenge because it does have a wide variety of characters and they do kind of change from page to page. I can't just sort of have a default version of all of these because they all need to be very, very different. Okay, so how do we actually go about tackling a challenge like this? Let's jump into the drawing and look at how that works. Okay, so starting with the original character design, the first thing I try to work out are the overall proportions. This is best thought of as the skeleton. So the things that we're trying to figure out here are how does this character move? Where is the anatomy and structure that form the original design located? Where are all those joints? And we can think of this as essentially our stick figure or our glorified stick figure. So again, let's look at how that kind of works for the fox. 
what we've sort of got is a mass of the chest that again just kind of helps to position the character in space and then the next thing I'm sort of looking for again is the rib cage and under the rib cage is the pelvis and again it's similar to our sort of Loomis skeleton we're going to have a few joints our stick figure and then the only difference is that the fox here has obviously some sort of animal legs so if we were to draw that from the side right again we've sort of got the torso we've got the pelvis right we've got the legs and again what i'm looking for are those sort of relationships right the relationships to each other how big are the different sort of elements how long is that sort of snout right again it's like oh maybe it's like a little bit sort of smaller again where does it sit in relation to everything where are those ears right like how do they sort of how do they sit on the figure how do they sit on the head there are they sort of pointing back are they pointing forward and again i'm just trying to sort of learn the character so this is just a matter of sort of sketching if you're playing around with this but we're looking at the original design we did which again is very similar to this and just trying to kind of figure out that sort of skeleton so again we've kind of got right the knee sort of bends but it's got that sort of animalistic sort of foot and again the arms are kind of pretty pretty long right so they're probably going to be you know because he's uh because he's sort of bent they're, they're, they're going to be pretty low to the ground right because it, it's almost like he sort of has arms that are as long as they would be if he was sort of standing up sort of straight right so again his his arms are going to be quite long and it's just a matter again of sort of figuring that out so let's again rough this in and we'll see how close we can get there we go we've got our basic skeleton and really all it is is a very similar version to what you would sort of see with a standard human mannequin we've got torso we've got a sphere for the head and then we've got sticks for the legs and the arms and again a major sort of part of this sort of skeleton is obviously the crutch right because again it needs to sort of be balanced it needs to balance on everything and so again as part of learning the design one of the things we're doing is figuring out sort of how that stuff really really functions now the next thing to do is to figure out what major forms are also part of the character's design in the case of the fox the major forms are going to be the torso right which we kind of already sort of you know played around with there and the head with the muzzle right so again the head needs to be sort of designed with the sort of muzzle right with the snout of that sort of fox as part of that design right so again we need to sort of start thinking about that sort of structure and where those different parts of that head sort of go and again just the size and proportion now again it's a secondary character so it's not like when i'm creating the mannequin for pinocchio i don't need to redraw it a, a million times i can kind of play around with it and he doesn't need to do the same degree of acting um so again i don't need to understand it to the same degree although again ultimately if you the more time you have to do these kind of proportional measurements the better things will get but again we've got that basic bowl right the the snout the muzzle whatever you want to call it 
the ears I think are, are actually quite an important part of the design because um, you know sort of cats and dogs often act with their ears and again we've got that torso and it's mostly important to just understand the the basic gestural quality that he has right so he has this fundamental gesture of kind of being a little bit sort of hobbled and bent over again because he's basically a, a grifter right his his sort of you know whole act is he's kind of pretending a little bit to be um sort of crippled so that he can um you know trick people I, I guess that's sort of the idea so again he's acting as if he's um an invalid and again structurally what we're after is sort of thinking about where right if we were to view that from the side we're thinking about where this knee is sort of above the top of the torso there so thinking about that in space once we kind of find that then again we can sort of think of these joints and again think about where that other sort of bottom of the 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 sort of um, shin would be right then we sort of go down right then we go sort of out here and again so we're trying to line these things up and again understanding how that sort of functions and how that sort of skeleton works in three dimensions is really important now you'll notice again if you've sort of been um, you know following um, sort of st other structural drawing tutorials that again this is very similar to kind of the Loomis mannequin that's sort of on purpose that's kind of uh, because again what we're doing is we're trying to transfer a lot of the knowledge we already have for drawing human anatomy to drawing a little mannequin here and so that's really all we sort of need to do we need to think about right like how this character is sort of positioned now you notice again you know as we sort of do these drawings if you're figuring this out it, it's one thing again to kind of understand the structure it, it's another thing to kind of nail the proportion and again it's been a while since i've sort of drawn this character so i'm not really expecting to be able to nail the proportion um you know 100 that's something we'd kind of adjust and you'd, you'd keep sort of doing some drawings for it keep playing around again it does uh it does take a while to kind of reassess right pinocchio i can draw you know anytime anywhere um and sort of make him still feel as if he is that character the you know the fox and the cat i need to kind of recalibrate a bit again because you know it's a secondary character so those would be the the sort of main secondary forms right we've got the that we sort of need to account for we've got the stick figure we've got the torso we need to pay attention to the the tilt of the torso right relative to the knees and we need to sort of pay attention to the length of those limbs because again if we get that right it does feel like the character is crouched but balanced at the same time so again we're doing an analysis on the posture and the mannequin is actually helping us to understand and um, better um, represent the character and their posture and their emotion right so built into this is is sort of a default emotion that helps me to sort of draw him right because if he's always in that pose he always feels as if he's kind of that um again that specific mix of you know someone who is, again is sort of a bit of a rogue right pretending to be um sick like that so again it's uh, just a matter of sort of putting in those forms now the last one that is going to be there as part of those sort of secondary forms is the tail right so again i think i said i th think i said secondary forms i meant sort of major primary forms so these are still major sort of primary forms so and again all the tail is is basically just a big old right a big old sort of cylinder so the things that we're paying attention to here are again drawing through right finding the the form of that cylinder now why is that important well again if we find the form of that cylinder it'll help us to render it 
Why is it important, again, to find the skeleton and all those kind of points, even though, again, what we might have is uh, that, the, you know, a lot of the clothing might actually cover up some of those skeleton bits. Um, again, we need to know where all of this stuff is so that we can go and tackle the next stage. All right. And it's important to note here, again, just to, as, a, as a little reminder that the tail is a part of the major forms because, again, animals tend to act a little bit with their tails. And it also is a really good indication of uh, some fundamental overlapping forms where we're going to have, again, the, the forms of the, the cloak are going to sort of, uh, the coat that he's sort of got sort of overlap. The tail kind of allows us to push into the distance and again, gives us some very nice natural overlapping forms, which always are just going to sort of give add appeal um, and sort of help just from a general sort of image making compositional standpoint, right? Again, the more overlapping shapes you can have, the more sort of um, uh, visual interest there's going to be. Sounds simple, but uh, sounds silly and, and a little bit basic, but uh, you know, often those things are, are the things that matter. The other thing that it does is we can move the eye with it a bit, right? It sort of does help to give his character a bit of flow, right? And that's why, again, I sort of make the tail a major form. And I think it's important to put it in um, early and, and, and really consider where it's going. So the clothing is also a big part of the design here. And this is where I think, again, stuff gets tricky. It, it's not necessarily always cut and dry. The clothing is a major part of the overall shape. But we do need to place it on last because from a drawing sequential point of view, if we put it on last, it'll flow better over the primary forms. And this is often why it's so important to understand the structure and the sequence. The character doesn't look like it should without the big coat, but we need to have a system for drawing him without it until the other forms are basically placed accurately. If we get the sequence right here, we can make sure we draw the clothes easily in one go instead of adjusting and erasing all the time. So often what I'll do is try to indicate the mass of the clothing very lightly. And that will sort of reassure me here. As you can see, I kind of put it in and that gives me a bit of an indication of like, right, I can kind of imagine in my head where some of these shapes are going to go. That kind of, again, reassures me that the character is going to look okay in the end without committing too early. So I can still sort of move some of these things around, but I am going to sort of like lightly sort of place those things there. And the trick is to build up the next set of forms in a sensible sequence. So let's look at how we do that. And um, again, we'll sort of repeat this process and then sort of think about adding those secondary forms. All right, so this gives us pretty much the same level of sort of what we had in the previous drawing. We've got our sort of skeleton roughed in. We've got a good idea about where everything is going. Again, if I sort of put the tail in there as well. So the next step is to push those secondary forms. And in this case, that's really about massing in the major limbs and again doing as much work we work as we can to figure out you know exactly where the tail's going and all of those little bits and pieces so the trick is to build up these next set of forms in a sensible sequence what we're doing now is adding secondary form in traditional figure drawing we would consider this to be things like the major muscle groups the deltoid the bicep the pectoral muscles for cartoony characters, we don't often have this type of structure though, but we do have a set of shapes and forms which make up the major limbs and hands, etc. These forms have a shape that is unique to the character and the goal there is to draw in this form for all of the elements and make sure the proportions are working, that the overall pose is working.
it's important to note that often drawing through when we're doing characters, it's not always about, you know, sort of complicated perspective. It's just about the simple idea of starting with the basic forms and making sure, again, you know, if we do things like draw, um, you know, something like an ellipse, like he's sort of got this um, sort of sash around his waist that, again, I'm going to find the line that we do see by drawing through and carrying that around to the back. In a similar way, I'm going to find the bottom of his coat by drawing an ellipse kind of, um, you know, just above the ground there. And that, again, helps me to sort of find that form there. So it doesn't have to be a matter of, again, technical perspective. It, it's often just sort of logic, right? The other thing we obviously do is that we draw the clothing on top of everything else. So the next step is to deal with the details. Now, we're still drawing a simplified, stylized character. So the details are less about adding tiny tertiary forms and subtle form changes in the face. The details in this instance are more about refining the shapes and simple forms which are already there to emphasize character and emotion to make sure that the simple forms are actually doing their job. This often means that moving a line a tiny little bit one way or adjusting the shape of a mouth or an eye can dramatically change the feel of the character. We need to make sure that all of those details are working well along with adjusting the details of the clothing and, you know, any other small little things which actually are a part of the design. Part of the design process is to repeat this process a few times to see how it goes and see if we can repeat the same steps and get the character to feel the same from drawing to drawing. Can we get them looking similar from different angles? and in different poses? That really is the question. If you are learning, then this sort of task is something you can do as a part of your sketching ritual, as a part of your development. If you keep practicing drawing your own character this way, you're actually practicing a lot of the fundamental skills of perspective and form drawing and character. And you're doing this while you're tackling a task that's very similar to what you will actually need to do if you do want to draw comics or illustrations with the same characters again and again. The more you try and draw and act through your characters, the more challenges you'll come across to refining their design and your technical drawing at the same time. Choose different poses, put your character in different situations, see how you tackle each of these challenges and how this teaches you to refine the sequence and the way you draw. Once you've mastered the character, you can then use it as a great way to warm up. It becomes something well inside your comfort zone. It's also a really good idea to vary the size that you do this at. Try some of them really small, some of them bigger. This will help you stay flexible and teach you the skills you need to apply when drawing illustrations and comics. Remember, we don't often get to choose the size we draw the character. That's often defined by the story and composition. And when we're planning that, we don't want to be sort of restricted by the scale, by what we are already sort of good at drawing. We want to make the character the right size for the job, then draw that size well. And that's why, again, I think it's really important to vary the size that you do these kind of little um, character drawings and exercises at. Keep in mind your ability to line things up and draw solidly has a lot to do with your basic understanding of perspective and form drawing and doing a small amount of technical study in those areas each day will help you improve. This doesn't mean a small amount overall, it just means again a little bit every day will go a long way and you'll find just generally it will kind of seep into your work and make your work a little bit more solid the better you understand those concepts. But at the end of the day, if you want to improve your technical drawing, simply tackling these challenges is a great way to hone your craft while drawing fun things. Anyway, that's all I got. Catch you around. Happy drawing.